So today's New Testament reading comes from Colossians 4, 2 through 18, and you can find that on page 985 in the pew back Bibles in front of you. Colossians 4, 2 through 18. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onsimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who was one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, that is a hard name. My fellow prisoner greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who was one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in prayers, and that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the church. Whoops. Give my greetings to the brothers of Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you've received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand Remember my chains. Grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. My name is Wendell Rosebrook, and I am the pastor at Bethel Baptist Church here. And it's my honor to be with you this morning. Uh, I will say this on the front side, uh, that I am a full believer in the providence of God. And uh, as a result of uh, some circumstances, some things that happened in our life a few weeks ago, I'm here this morning and not in the woods where I would like to be, okay? And I am going to be. But I'm not today, and so I'm here with you, and so I will say this also, uh, that I am not here by accident. As God is sovereign in all things, uh, it is certainly not, nor was it anyone's will, that uh, someone got sick over the weekend. One of Trevor's children got sick. It is not anyone's desire that that happens, but... You know, for you to know that in that, uh, God has a word for someone, even if it's just me, in this time this morning. So I, uh, if, if you would just keep your Bibles open this morning as we work through this fourth chapter of the book of Colossians, as we've been going through it together, uh, both King's Cross and Bethel, and we're uh, really going to finish up and close the book uh, today on what Paul is saying to this church. So I was looking and preparing and, and getting ready for the week. And I, I just finished a book 
uh, some, you know, uh, kind of a, a pleasurable read uh, for me. And uh, it, it's a book that that took me to the beginning of the 20th century. All right, not the 19. Hundreds, but the, from from 1800 into 1900, in the early years of the 20th century, from about 1898 to about 20 uh, to about 1918 or 1919, it was a time and it was an age. It was really it was back when I was a kid. It was a time of great adventures and great adventurers. Uh, they, there were, you know, we, we, some of you may have remembered or may remember the space race, uh, not, probably not many, but the space race from like the late 1950s to the mid 1970s and the race to the moon. And I uh, remember the, the coverage in 1967 or 68 when, when we uh, sent the first lunar module and landed on the moon and all of that. But the early part of that same century from the early 1900s was a race to discover and explore the Antarctic region of Earth. One of the principal adventurers was a man by the name of Sir Ernest Shackleton, and he set out in 1914 to be the first person to cross overland the continent of the Antarctic. It had, it had been discovered. Uh, they had reached uh, that area several years before. He was actually a part of two other Antarctic expeditions or journeys to the Antarctic, but he wanted to be the first to cover overland the Antarctic continent. It's a great read. I won't go into the whole story. It's a great read. You don't have to. He was a sailor, and it's all about sailing, but you don't have to have, know anything about sailing to read a, this, this story. It, it truly is a great read, if for no other reason than to see and to begin to have an understanding of what can be accomplished, what can be achieved, if you don't let what's happening right here get in the way of the big picture that God has for your life. The things that happen on that journey, the current situation that could have pressed in very heavily on the crew members of the, the ship called the Endurance, of which only one of the original crew members was lost during this entire journey. So it's a great read if for no other reason to see what your mind can achieve if you don't let your immediate situation cloud everything about what, what can happen. While we can't, or it hasn't been entirely verified, legend has it that there was an advertisement placed in the newspapers in London for crew members to accompany Ernest Shackleton on this journey or on this expedition. The newspaper advertisement, the once ad, read something like this. Thank you. Read something like this. Men wanted for hazardous journey. Small wages, bitter cold, Long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. <laughs> Honor and recognition in case of success. And I think for many, as we think about ministry, or if we think about things that God might have us to do, that job solicitation posting, if you will, except for the very last line, the last line said, honor and recognition in case of success. I think we would read that, many people read that want to add with the same kind of sense of adventure when they think about ministry. 
even in our neighborhoods, right? Uh, small wages, bitter cold, right? You're going to get some cold receptions. Um, complete darkness. We're, 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 we were taking this into uh, a, a dark world, this message of Christ. So I think if many times we think about ministry and, and the things that God may be calling us to do, and we look at it and we read that job posting, and we say, uh-uh, it's not for me. It's not for me. Well, Ernest Shackleton, for a crew of 27 that he needed, he had over 500 applicants for this expedition, this call to adventure, if you will. As he was interviewing potential crew members, he, he picked some sailors, he picked a scientist, he picked a photographer, he picked uh, any number of odd, what would seem to be odd job titles to become parts of his crew. And many of them he picked and he chose just because he liked the way they carried themselves. Very unscientific in how he assembled his crew once he got past the sailors. Of course, he had to have sailors. But he had all kinds of personalities, all kinds of skill sets, and none of them, again, knew the outcome. As we look at this letter, and as we have worked through this letter to this church at Colossae, Paul is preparing the people of this church, these new believers, to respond to the call to be involved in ministry. He's given them tools. He's, he's worked and, and given them uh, encouragement and told them he's praying for them. But the difference that he's showing them in this letter is that the outcome can be assured much differently than what Ernest Shackleton could assure the outcome of his crew. But first, we must answer the call. So we think about that this morning. What is your call? What is your ministry? And how do we get there? And how do we work through all of that? I have two sons, <clears throat> both of them ran track in high school, and so we've been in many track meets, and if you go to track meets and you pay attention to the things that are happening, you hear uh, what are called uh, the calls to the events. You have three calls, the first and the second and the third, right? See, I can count all the way to three. The first call, if you will, is the athlete's first announcement to begin to prep for your race, to do the things, to get start, start getting your head involved in the race, to, to begin to get your, if, if it's a relay, to get your other team members together. But it is a call to, to just begin your prep. You've got some time, but just know that your race is coming. Paul has begun to do that. His first call in this letter was the call, if you will, all the way back in chapter 1, to, to press in and to understand and to realize and embrace the preeminence of Christ. If we go into ministry, if, and if we enter into a time, and, and ministry it covers a, a whole lot of facets, right? It's not just what we do Right on a weekly basis, whether it's me or Orion or Trevor or or Howard, that that's ministry in in a context that's not much different in many cases as we go through our week is the ministry opportunities that you all have as, as you go to work or to school or to your your just in in your neighborhoods. But we we know that if we embrace the preeminence of Christ that we already have been chosen. We know that we've been called. We know that we've been gifted. And we can know that we've been empowered by the one who created all of this, 
Oh, and by the way, he holds it all together, even in the midst of what may seemingly be a very chaotic time in our world today. Christ is holding this together. There are, t- there are opportunities that we have, even in these times, especially in these times, to share the word of hope found in Christ. So we can know his first call is to embrace the preeminence of Christ. Paul's second call, we spent a lot of time talking about that. The second call in the track meet is, is the call for the athletes to increase their intensity. The race, your time, it's getting closer. And so you need to really begin to increase your focus, increase your intensity, because it's going to happen and we need you to be ready. The second call for Paul here in this letter was for us to, to, to walk strong and to, to put on the new self and to, to do, uh, understand your new identity in Christ, that you really are a new creation in Christ, that the old has passed away. And behold, Paul says, that word behold means to look intently, to focus on your new identity. All things are made new. That's the second call. And the final call for an attract meet is get to the starting line because it's time to go. I was going to bring my starting pistol, but probably would not have been appropriate in this setting, right? Your race is going to begin. And so this final call for Paul is this chapter, chapter four for us, as we heed the call and, and we say, he says to us, he says, go and fulfill your ministry. Do that which you've been called to do. So let me pray with you, and then we'll dive into our text. Father, thank you for your word today. Father, thank you as you have have called us and gifted us and empower us for ministry, that we see how and where and when and why we're to be involved in your work in our world and in our own specific lives and context. Thank you for these words and thank you for this time together this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Well, the first thing that we see here in in chapter four and verse two, let me just read it real quickly. He says this, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Before we enter into any kind of ministry opportunity, we must bathe it in prayer. He says, continue steadfastly. He says that word continue in the New American Standard, it's it's rendered devote yourselves. Think about that often because prayer is that which keeps us. See, we've been empowered. Do you believe that? We've been empowered by the preeminent Christ. But prayer is that the peace that keeps us connected to the power source. In our current situation, and your situations may change over and over and over, even from day to day, or sometimes, I was talking to to Julian even just this morning, sometimes from, from hospital room to hospital room, your situation may change as you're talking to someone different, maybe with a different faith background, and we must be able to, and as we bathe that in prayer, we can then receive the words and the message from Christ or from God, as it says that never worry about what you're going to say because he will give you the words that need to be said in that particular situation as we continually bathe it in prayer. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Never let that be lost on us, the power that prayer has for us in our ministry. He says, be watchful. Be watchful. What does he mean by that? He says, 
first of all, look for opportunities to do ministry, right? But it also means think about what it is that you need to pray for specifically in that situation. If you're going to go next door and you know that your next door neighbors and, the, the, you know, that, that particular family may be struggling financially or they may be struggling in their marriage or they may be struggling with their children or they just may be struggling. What is it that you can pray for specifically as you go into that situation? It's that same thing. Be watchful, right? How? With what? With Thanksgiving. How many times have we seen that sentiment just in the last three or four weeks in this series? Everything we do, we do it with Thanksgiving, and that Thanksgiving is the remembrance of all of the promises that God has kept for us already. And if we, if we enter a situation knowing that God has already been there for one but he's given us fulfilled promises over and over and over it gives us that much more confidence to continue to go forward so we're to pray with thanksgiving for past promises and for future hopes continue steadfastly in prayer being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. So we're to pray for ourselves, but we're also to pray for others in ministry. I hope you spend much time praying for your pastors. I'm sure that you do. Spend much time praying for them and, and that, that, that they uh, continue to be empowered and that they because the race is long and difficult for them but you pray for others in in ministry and, and paul even gives you a specific opportunity here that that god would open doors for ministry and evangelism to them are you praying specifically for yourself that God would open opportunities for you to share the love of Christ? Or do we see just the hazardous journey or the constant danger or the safe return doubtful message continually in our head? Paul says, continue to pray for others and pray for opportunities that God would open doors for ministry and evangelism. It was so important to Paul that he said, I'm in prison because of it. Not in an arrogant way. He says, I'm writing to you from prison and I'm in prison because of the gospel. And yet I'm encouraging you. He's encouraging us to continue to pray. That is Paul's first call here in this last chapter, to steadfastly pray. As you pray, know that there are ministry opportunities out there that are happening. His second call, happen, gives, we find in, in verse number five, he says this, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer, you ought to answer each person. Walk in wisdom. We spent a lot of time talking about walking strong and putting off the old self and putting on the new characteristics of a believer. And now that's, but, but now we, so now that we've got all of the facts, all of the knowledge of what, what, what we need to do now he says all right let's shift gears and let's put some application to it let's walk in not only in the strength and in the characteristics but in the wisdom of the what to do in the that specific situation See, wisdom is nothing other than the right application of the knowledge that we have so we've been given that knowledge we see what paul has said to us now walk in wisdom all right in other words he says walk in a manner back to chapter 1 and verse 10 walk in a manner that's worthy of the lord
Walk in wisdom toward who? Toward outsiders. Who are those outsiders? Right? Who are outsiders? It's a word that literally means unbelievers. That we are to walk in such a way, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12, he says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. See, we're to walk in, in, for, with those and in front of those who have no belief yet in that essentially that no accusation will stand against us. Walk in such a way that we put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Chapter 3 and verse 16 in, in, in 1 Peter says this to us. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. In other words, what, what, what can happen is if we live right, if we live in a, in a way that reflects Christ, even those around those who are calling us out will shout them down. Say, no, that's not right in that person's life. So we're to walk in wisdom towards unbelievers, walk in a way that nothing can be accused of us that will have any merit or any basis and nothing will stand. Doesn't mean we're necessarily going to be Teflon where nothing sticks, but that's kind of the picture that Paul is, is, is giving us here. He says, walk that way, but also, all right, well, here's the hard part. Also, we have to talk that way, right? We have to talk that way. Does your walk reflect your talk is one way to put it. Let's flip that. Does your talk reflect your walk? This is, I think, sometimes lately in the, in, in the last few years where many of us get uh, in, in, in trouble because we, we find ourselves behind a screen with a keyboard in front of us, and then we feel like we can just say whatever we want. Well, that is not a biblical way to go about that. We, we, are to, we are to talk in the same way that we walk with wisdom towards outsiders. Paul says in Ephesians, the church, of course, where this church was planted from, he says, Ephesians 4.29, let nothing corrupt come out of your mouth, but what is good for building up, for edification, for encouragement, and for instruction. We would all do well your speaker more than most, if we would engage our brain before we engage our tongue. We would all do well to think that way. He's walk, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Talk in wisdom towards outsiders. Again, Peter says, always be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in you. That's the wisdom that we can gain from these words. He says, seasoned with salt. And there we go. Well, I'm just seasoning my words with salt, right? <clears throat> what is Paul saying to us? Salt is both a purifying agent, but it's also a seasoning as well. It's a flavoring agent as well. How many put salt on just about everything on their plate, even after your wife salts it or you salt it before you cook it? How many? Be don't, don't, you know, if, if you've got issues with high blood pressure, whatever, nobody's judging anything. Do you put salt on your food, on your plate? Why? They still don't want to talk back. Flavor, right? Flavor. It just doesn't taste right without salt. So we need to season our words to give them the flavor of Christ. 
blessing, purifying, edification, encouragement, instruction. I guess I've come to the point where I think there's enough hate speech out there in the world that we don't need to add to it. That's kind of where I am. There's a whole lot of us, a whole lot of us in the church that need to put our keyboards down and just stop talking. Because we're not flavoring, seasoning it with salt. So we need to beware and we need to be, under, uh, be, be uh, uh, on guard against that. Paul's final call. We've seen the first call and the second call. This, the final call that Paul gives us is the call that, that your race is about to start. It's time to shed all of the rest of the things that are going to hold you back and just dive into your work. His final call is to fulfill your ministry. We see that really from verses 7, seven through 18, but I want to jump to verse 17 first and then I'll back up. Thank you, Julian, for reading all of those names. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be much more difficult in, in, in our service because we have a deaf interpreter and I've already warned her that we have all of these names and so she just... Just tell them to look in the screen, all right? I'm not. Just, she, 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 the, the names are hard because they have to spell each one of them out. But your, 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 your final call here is to fulfill your ministry, verse 17, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. You've been... Commission, you may have been commissioned by a church. You may have been commissioned by a denomination. You may have been commissioned as an elder in a particular body. But the work that we do, the work that you do is the Lord's work. He says, see that you fulfill the ministry that you received in the Lord. And since it is a ministry that's given to you, from the Lord, it is worthy of your best work, as we saw in chapter 3 on two different occasions. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through, through him, and work heartily with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. So everything that we do in this realm, we're to do with our best effort because your work is from the Lord. But we can know even in that that you're not alone in this work. That's why Paul gives this whole long list of names to this church. He says all of these other people, they are working with you, just maybe not in the same place as you. We, there are many of us doing all of this work Tychus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Barnabas, Mark, Jesus, who is called Justice, Demas, Luke, the beloved physician, all of these different people that know we're all in this same, on this same expedition together, just in different parts of the world and in different contexts. So your effort, you're not, you're not alone in this work. And that there's no small work in the work of the Lord. There's nothing small, right? We look and we read in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14 or 12 and 14 and at all of the, the gifts of the Spirit and the way the body is put together and the, you know, the Christ is the head and we are the body and all of the different workings and part and, and members of the body and all of them are important. They all have their function. And, and, and even Paul goes to the point to say that the lesser members are the ones that are given more honor. We just get the privilege of standing in front of you because we've been gifted in a certain way. But that doesn't make your ministry in your context, in your place, any less important than mine. In fact, for many, it makes it more important than mine. Because you will have people in your sphere of influence that I will never 
have the opportunity to meet or to speak with. And how you handle those people in your spheres of influence, that is your ministry. And it is important because it, it is the Lord's work. And we must understand that and we must embrace that and we must know that I've been called and I've been gifted and I've been empowered by the one who is preeminent and holds it all together. And he will, he has promised the thanksgiving, he has promised to go with you. We can go in that power. But he singles out this one in verse 7, Tychus says, he will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Right? This, this man was not uh, a, a, a preeminent figure. That, that's the, the wrong word. Christ is the only one preeminent. He was not a, 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 really a, a known figure within the church. He was three things. He was a, a beloved brother. He was a faithful minister, and he was a fellow servant. He was the one that was tasked with taking this letter to the church at Laodicea and the church at Colossae. And he, he, he delivered the message, but, but Paul didn't consider him to be less than he was. They were equals in Paul's eyes, they were just given different tasks or separate tasks to be done. One commentator put it this way. He said, there are no, there is greatness, there is greatness in the smallest work that's done for Christ. Know that. There is greatness in the smallest work that's done for Christ. Momentary things momentary things are eternal. They have eternal ramifications. So you may not think that anything, that, that little tiny thing that you did has any impact at all. But that's not the picture that we see in this scripture. There is greatness in the smallest work done for Christ. Momentary things done for Christ are eternal. So as we close the book, if you will, on this letter to this church, I hope and I pray that, that we will see, that we'll hear something different in Paul's final words to a people that he never met. Words that say to them, words that I hope say to us, that your new identity in Christ places you on mission for Christ. Oh, oh, and there's one more thing. Honor and recognition are waiting for you in the end. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you for your word and your, this time this morning together. And as we absorb and think about your words to us at the close of this letter, that, that we would recognize and understand that we all have a mission to fulfill. And you've called us to do that. And Father, that we would answer that call. God, I thank you for this time together, and I pray that as we transition now into a time of confessional and examination and communion, that you would just continue to bless the time that we have this morning. And we pray in Jesus' name.